Um, this is obviously the 20th uh, IMS meeting and we're very lucky to be in Athens where I think the uh, uh, conference center and all the facilities have been amazing. And our session today is really um, focused on the idea that obviously in myeloma, the median age is 70, which means a large, the majority of our patients are older and therefore frailer. And in that context, as we think about the revolution in T-cell redirecting therapy and of course cellular therapies, we recognize that there are limitations in the older frailer population for the applicability of those technologies in, in, in that, their particular case. So my session is focused on thinking a little bit differently and saying, well, you know, how do we manage the older, frailer patient in the relapse setting. And so my discussion is focusing on what we know now as patients are both lenalidomide and daratumumab refractory typically at the time of first relapse, what do we do? And so my uh, presentation today is focused on um, the roles of isotuximab, elotuzumab, these next generation antibodies, you know, how, how much further do we get in terms of their efficacy? And probably with isotuximab, for example, in combination with other approaches, there may be a role for rechallenge. Elotuzumab, certainly with pomalidomide, you know, the data are very interesting and it's a very well tolerated platform. But generally speaking, after CD38, targeted therapy fails a patient, we have to think differently. And so the question is, can we reach for BCMA? Well, obviously cellular therapies and bispecifics are very applicable to a significant number of patients. But to the older, frailer patient, are there other things that we should think about? And we are discussing the role of pomalidomide combined with bortezomib, for example, the classic optimism regimen, recognizing that we have survival data at this meeting presented by my colleague, uh, Miral Bechak, which shows really interesting benefit with long-term uh, follow-up on the combination of pomalidomide and bortezomib um, with both survival benefit with a particular uh, a priori design to the analysis, as well as sustained benefit in terms of PFS and PFS2. So these are exciting concepts. We then go next step further and say, well, okay, once you know we think beyond pomalidomide, what do we do? And obviously the BCMA targets very attractive with an antibody drug conjugate like Balantabab mafodotin, recognizing that that has had promise in the phase two setting, run into a few more difficulties in phase three trials in terms of endpoint assessments and so forth. But ultimately, the combination strategies are showing real promise. For example, if you combine Balantabab mafodotin with pomalidomide, the median progression free survival approaches two years. And so, as you think about that in a frailer patient in whom that may be a preferable approach, that that's very attractive. And then the rest of the focus of our meeting today is really on our session is to say, well, what about other approaches? And obviously, if you're translocation 1114 positive, you know, venetoclax, although it's not approved in the United States or Europe specifically for myeloma, is a very attractive option to combine with other drugs. In Europe, there's obviously the full approval of the peptide drug conjugate melflufen, which is important to remember because it's really very different to a traditional cytotoxic. It's a targeted delivery system for a alkylator warhead, and it's highly immunogenic. It delivers this warhead directly to the tumor cell. It disrupts both nuclear and mitochondrial DNA, which mechanistically is terribly important because it's able to overdrive 17P resistance in preclinical systems, and we now have clinical data to support that. And in combination, it's shown real promise with response rates between 70 and 80% if you combine it with either a proteasome inhibitor or monoclonal antibody. So really interesting data around that that's emerging. Then beyond uh, uh, drugs like melflufen and venetoclax, we obviously have Selenexor, um, which is an XPO1 inhibitor. And now it's fully approved in the United States, totally novel mechanism. And it works by inhibiting the ability of the tumor cell to respond to specific signals in terms of uh, uh, tumor suppressor proteins. It exports those, and this XPO1 inhibition prevents that. So really an important construct around Selenexor is that it's able to disrupt key aspects of cellular machinery and nuclear uh, transcription that relate to resistance, particularly from 17P. So I always think of Selenexor as a very attractive option. And what we've learned is that if you give it once a week at low dose in combination with other strategies, 
some of the challenges of its side effect profile when you were dosing it twice a week go away. And that's, I think, very important for patients. And it's a very important add-on as we think about the therapeutic sandwich uh, of treating patients between various strategies, but in, for example, even the younger, fitter patients, as we think about on-ramping patients to CAR-T, for example, you know, these are approaches which a lot of my colleagues and I are using to help us um, keep those bridges moving uh, in the relapse refractory settings so that we benefit our patients in the long term. So our session's an exciting one in that it frames all of this for the audience, gives them a sort of real world perspective on what uh, the options are. And then I think what's so exciting, and I want to really finish with this if I may, is some of the new, new directions. And as we think about lenalidomide and pomalidomide failure in patients, where do we go next? Well, the really good news is that there are the cell mods. These are truly different. Um, there are cerebral E3 ligase modulators. They're powerful, they're distinct, they overcome imid failure, both preclinically and clinically. And what's important to recognize is that the, the lead compound, which is iberdamide, um, is well tolerated and a can overdrive uh, lenalidomide and pomalidomide resistance. We had a very nice session yesterday outlining that in the setting of the updated data on iberdamide combined with dexamethasone. But even better than iber in the relapse setting, or iberdamide as we call it, is mesigdamide. Mesigdamide is that much more potent preclinically and it's reflected in its behavior in the clinic. Just an oral agent combined with dexamethasone, we see response rates of over 40% in triple class refractory disease. Um, when we go into extramedullary disease, it's even more impressive in the sense that for a single agent that's oral, we drive a response rate of 30%, which is very interesting. And then I think what was very exciting to me with the mesigdamide work um, is that in the patients who are BCMA exposed, in other words, they may have had belantamab methadotin, a bispecific or even CAR-T, we have a response rate of 50%. So this is just an oral therapy. It has all the advantages of community availability. And if I may, it's truly off the shelf. I mean, you come to clinic, you can prescribe it. I mean, that's, that's the huge advantage. So I'm very excited by it. And I think that uh, the whole class of cell mods are offering us a whole new avenue of oral therapy for our patients. So that in a nutshell has been our session.